First of all, thank you to those involved in the music ministry today. When John was uh, talking about having the Sunday off, he said he was having a hard time getting somebody to, to fill in one of our regu- all of our regular substitutes, and even the irregular substitutes uh, were busy today. Uh, so it turns out it was just our people. And uh, thank you to Derek and, and the others, uh, I think. Yep, thank you all very much for your, for your leadership today. As we look at the scripture today, we're in Daniel chapter 8. And what we're going to see in this uh, passage is that it is somewhat similar to what we looked at in Daniel chapter 7. There's a vision there's an interpretation, uh, and then there is Daniel's response to this. Uh, So it might seem a little bit familiar uh, to what we did last week. At the same time, uh, we're going to, I'm gonna read all this chapter today. Sometimes I don't read it all word for word, uh, but today we're gonna read it, and we're gonna run through the first 26 verses of this fairly quickly. There are a lot of, a lot of uh, prophecies here, but the reason we're going to go through it quickly is because this has already been fulfilled prophecy. It's not something that, that we're waiting for, but these things have been literally fulfilled. So we're going to get to the end, hit dead stop, and then spend a lot of time there on Daniel's response, his reaction to this. Because at the end... He has a very spiritual, very uh, deep emotional reaction to this highly spiritual experience. So let's, I'll read the first couple of verses here today to get us started in Daniel chapter 8. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, and this is two years after Daniel chapter 7, I had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa, in the province of Elam, in the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these words, and we ask that you would use them to, uh, to open us up. Your words are powerful. They divide the soul and spirit. The, just they, they work on our hearts. And Lord, help us to, uh, to be receptive to what you have for us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the third year of King Belshazzar's uh, reign. This actually happens chronologically before Daniel goes into the lion's den, uh, but it's just that Daniel is divided. There's six stories in the first six chapters, and then the last six chapters are a lot of vision prophecies. That's why it's not organized from beginning to end. Well, Daniel sees himself in Susa, which is not where he is right now, where he is, where he lives. He lives in Babylon, which is 500 miles away from Susa. Now, in seven years from moving forward from Daniel chapter 8, which actually happens in Daniel chapter (laughs) 5, complicated chronology here, seven years from now, According to this chapter that we're in now, the Persians, the Medes and the Persians will take over Babylon. King Belshazzar will have the big feast and he will be judged. The judgment will come for him that night. And the Persians will establish Susa as their capital city. Uh, Later on uh, in Old Testament chronology, Nehemiah will be in Susa. Uh, The Queen Esther will be in Susa. But Daniel is living in Babylon, seeing things from the perspective that he's in Susa. Well, this vision, and I'll read down to verse 14 here, because this is the vision, and then there's an interpretation of it. This is what he sees. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as he charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him. None could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn became, or between his eyes came from the west. 
crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him with great rage. I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was power, powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. The goat became very great, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off, and in its place four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of hosts, but it, and it took away the daily sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Because of his rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. Sounds like today, but anyway. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled, the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, and the surrender of the sanctuary, and of the host that will be trampled underfoot? He said to me, It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. Well, Daniel was watching this, and he didn't understand this. How could anyone understand this without some sort of divine knowledge? So as we go on here in verse 15, there's the interpretation of the vision starts. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man, and I heard a voice, a man's voice from heaven, or from the Uli calling, sorry, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. So, so in this vision, Daniel's seeing the vision, but he's also seeing a vision of what looks like a man, and it turns out this is the angel Gabriel, and a voice calls and says, Gabriel, tell Daniel what is going on here. So part of the vision, just part of it, is explained. And it goes on to say in verse 15, or verse 17, as he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face down to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, I'm going to tell you what will, be hap what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. And one of these horns was longer than the other horn. That represents the fact that in the Mede-Persian Empire, there was a dominant group. They were not equally balanced, but the Persians were much stronger than the Medes. I guess the Medes were in there enough to get their name attached to the empire, but the Persians were really, the, they were the longer horn there. And if you look in world history, what happened with the Persian Empire was that they were taken over by the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great was the leader of the Greek Empire. And he chose, do you know what animal he chose to represent his kingdom? In the United States, we have the eagle. What animal did Alexander the Great choose to represent his kingdom? It was a goat. And here we have a goat here. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation but will not have the same power. What, what Daniel's seeing here, what Gabriel is explaining here, are things that will happen in the 200s B.C. Daniel here is in the... 600s. You know what? I just blanked out on that. He's in the 500s. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so this is 300 years after Daniel is getting this vision. These things will come true. They're past. They're way past to us. But Alexander the Great, after he or when he died, he died fairly young at age 32. And he didn't leave a plan of succession. And his, the, the Greek Empire was broken into how many parts? Do you know? Four parts. These 
four horns represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. None of them had the same power. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king, and here Daniel is predicting things about a man who was, his name was Antiochus Epiphanes. He will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper. He will consider himself superior. Antiochus Epiphanes considered himself to be a god among the people. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. Antiochus Epiphanes will come back in more prophecy in the book of Daniel. Uh, But the vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you is true, but seal up the vision, for it concerns the distant future. There's no doubt, if you look in history, that the prophecies here in the beginning of this vision and the, the explanation here and some other things that will come up in Daniel, they related to uh, a ruler, a descendant of the Greek empire who had part of the Greek, Greek empire under his control. Uh, he went into Jerusalem and he caused some absolutely terrible things in the temple. He stopped sacrifices. He set himself up. They put some false things in there. And this was the, the man, the prophecy of this man. There's a strong connection. These things were fulfilled, but there's a strong connection to the person that we see in the New Testament called Antichrist, uh, who will also rise up and persecute the Jews and do destruction in Jerusalem. Uh, you can find some prophecies about him in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 13. Here's some parallels between this Antiochus Epiphanes and Antichrist. He will achieve great power, in the future Antichrist will by subduing others. He will rise to power by promising a false sense of security. He will be intelligent and persuasive. He will be controlled by someone else, and that is Satan. He will rise up in opposition to Jesus Christ and to God's people, and his rule will be terminated by divine judgment. If you read to the end of the book of Revelation, you can see who wins. Amen to that, yes. So these things were fulfilled completely, literally, in the time before Christ, but they foreshadow a second fulfillment later on with Antichrist. Now, before we look at Daniel's response, I need to say that there are some people who look at the detailed fulfillment of prophecy like that and say, okay, the reason that Daniel was so good at predicting the future was because this book was not actually written by Daniel 550 years before Christ, it was written after these things happened. That's an easy explanation, right? Well, there's another explanation. God is God. And God can give divine revelation and divine wisdom to people that they don't understand at the time. But he is powerful enough to do that. Either God is God or God is not. God. And we'll, we'll come back to this because that's an issue that comes up very strongly in chapter 11. But if God is not God, then we're all in trouble, right? What are we doing here today if God is not really God? Well, here's Daniel's response to this. It shows up a little bit in verses 17 and 18, but mostly in verse 27. And we did talk a little bit about this last week, but it's worth looking at again because it's so important. In verse 15, we see that Daniel watched the vision. He saw this with his eyes. He heard it with his ears. He experienced this. And he was terrified when the angel Gabriel came near to him. In verse 17, the angel Gabriel came near the place. I was terrified. I fell down on my face. And he goes into a deep sleep. While he was speaking to me, it says in verse 18, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. And in verse 27, it says that he's so exhausted, he has to lie down for several days. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. 
Daniel had a powerful reaction to this vision. In the New International, it says, the word there is that I was appalled by the vision. Other translations say that Daniel continued to be upset. He was greatly troubled. He was greatly distressed. He was astonished. This is really affecting Daniel, this this episode, this event. Well, the reason that the English language translations don't settle on one word to translate that Hebrew word is because this feeling that Daniel had was so intense and so complex, so deep. If you look over in Daniel chapter 9, verse 18, this word shows up other places in Daniel, but in chapter 9, verse 18, Daniel's praying, and he says, Give ear, O God, and hear, open your eyes, and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. Desolation ruins. That's what Daniel is feeling at this moment. He's been through something. Something has happened to him where he is just completely empty. He's feeling depressed and not just, oh, I'm a little bit down today. I'm a little bit blue today, but ruined, desolate. Have you ever felt like that? His soul is an empty wasteland because of this thing that has happened to him. Destroyed, empty. I just got hit by a truck, and then the truck backed up over me again. Have you ever felt like that? That happens to us. Well, there's more to his reaction. He finishes the chapter with these words that that this vision... This whole experience was beyond understanding. He had to confess that that he had no clue about his situation. What did this vision mean? He had to ask for help for that. Why would God give him this knowledge and this experience at this time? Why? Again, no clue. Why, Why now? No clue whatsoever. What was he supposed to do with this or learn from this? No clue at all. In summary, intellectually, Daniel knows something that he didn't know before, but but he doesn't know what it's for or what it means or why it happened. Physically, he's exhausted, and emotionally and spiritually, he is empty. He's going through something that is common to all of us. Because there are things that happen in our lives, in the human experience, that are devastating. Whether it's the loss of a spouse or a loss of, of, a, of a significant job or, or some kind of a grief or some change happens. It, we go through difficult things in our lives. Well, Daniel's had an amazing spiritual experience, and then he just goes right off a cliff. Let me put it like this. When you're on a roller coaster and you're on the top of the highest hill, right? Every roller coaster has a, a high spot on it. What happens after the high spot? <laughs> Pretty much the lowest spot in the whole thing, a big drop. When you climb a mountain and you reach the top, you enjoy the view for a while. But then what happens? You have to come back down. Sometimes you can walk down, sometimes you fall down the mountain. That's what Daniel's going through here. We've had this experience, those of us, you go on a retreat, it's a spiritual high, and you make a commitment, you make a connection to God and other people, and you come home and the cat box needs to be emptied. And the bills need to be paid. And just all that stuff, it's like deflation. You get to a point where you know you're hitting bottom because of some choices that you've made, and you look up to God, and you make a decision, this is going to be different, and you feel good, and you feel strong for about five minutes until that temptation hits again. Why does this happen to us? This happens because there are lessons to learn when you're at the top of the mountain. 
There are lessons to learn when you're in the valley, and there are lessons to learn when you're going up and as you're coming down. All kinds of things that God wants to teach us. It happens because spiritual work is both uplifting and exhausting at the same time. Of course, spiritual work is is very rewarding. You can have great experiences with God and and fellowship with uh, other believers and and see great things happen, and and it's good if you're willing to work for these things. They bring great rewards here in this life and in the next. But spiritual work is difficult. Spiritual growth does not come cheaply. To do spiritual work, you must pay a price with your soul. It costs you something in your soul to make progress with God. To give a significant gift to God, whether it's uh, money, time, heart, it costs you something. I'll say if your walk with God does not cost you anything, then it is not worth anything. Let me say that again. If your walk with God does not cost you something, it is not worth anything. A big step of faith, whatever that is for you, will cost you. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 22. I even referenced this last week, but I want to go into it, this again here. Luke 22. In Luke 22, uh, Judas agrees to betray Jesus, and there, there's the Last Supper. And then, uh, starting in verse 39, Jesus takes some of his closer disciples, and they go out to the Mount of Olives. And uh, verse 39 here, Jesus went out, as usual, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching that place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup. This spiritual work that Jesus had to do was going to cost him a lot, going to cost him everything. And what does he tell his disciples? Pray so that you will not enter temptation. And he prays this excruciating prayer. And while Jesus is 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 doing difficult work in prayer, what are his disciples doing? They've fallen asleep. And verse 45 tells us that he came back to them when he rose from prayer, went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Now, I don't think we're supposed to look down on them for this. They were human beings, they've had a difficult journey They've been with Jesus since the beginning of his ministry. They've been faithful. They've seen him do miracles, and they've been out doing miracles themselves. They've heard him preach, and they've done some preaching themselves. Jesus has sent them out a couple times probably to, to, to do some preaching. And because they chose to follow Jesus, there were, there were some who admired them and some who hated them. And the last week has been a difficult one. They've been very busy Uh, They've been in the temple every day. There's been a lot of confrontation. They know that something is coming to a head. They don't know what Jesus knows, but, but they're exhausted. They're empty. They have nothing left to give. And what does Jesus tell them? And What does Jesus tell you when you get to that point of desolation, exhaustion, nothingness? He says, pray. Don't sleep, though there is a time for sleep, obviously, but pray so that you will not enter into temptation. He's telling them, you've had the awesome privilege of being with me for three years and learning from me for for all this time. Don't let your emptiness and your weakness allow you to drift away from God and seeking God. Let your emptiness and your need bring you to a place where you learn about God, learn about Jesus and his strength, in a different way for you. Don't just think of prayer as, and and we need to pray prayers like, heal the sick, God. Cast out the demon. Give me the right words to say. 
Help me move, Lord, move that mountain. That's part of what prayer is and part of what Jesus says we should pray for and pray about. But there are other times when prayer is more like, help me, Lord. I know that in the past you helped me to run. Today, right now, I just need your help to walk one step. Help me just to get from this moment into the next. I can't do it without you today, Lord. Help me. So what should you do when you're at the end of yourself? When you're on the downside of a big upside or just down? Or even if you're up, pray. Your only hope is God. Psalm 25 says, To you, Lord, I lift my soul. In you I trust, O my God. You are my God, my Savior. My hope is in you. David didn't say, I'm the king now. I'm on top of the pile. I can do it. My hope is in you, Lord. In Philippians 4, Paul says there's a secret, a mystery about the spiritual life that he's learned. He says, I've been rich, I've been poor, I've been well-fed, I've been hungry, and I can do all things. Do you know the rest of it? All things through Christ who strengthens me. We know that we should never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our inner strength in the Lord is growing every day. These troubles and sufferings of our of ours are, after all, quite small and won't last, last very long. Yet this short time of distress will result in God's richest blessing upon us forever and ever. So we do not look at what we can see right now and all the troubles around us, but we look forward to the joys in heaven which we have not yet seen. The troubles will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your sufficiency in our time of need. We thank you that you are equal to the task of helping us, whatever our circumstances, whatever our needs. And Lord, help us to hold on to you in all the times, in all the, all the days, all the moments where we feel a need for you. And Lord, on the days when we're doing well, help us not to forget about you. Lord, don't give us so much that we would ever forget our need for you. Help us to, to seek after you every moment. And Lord, I would ask that if there's anyone here who, who does not know Jesus as their hope and forgiveness and, and, and strength, that they would open their heart and eyes to, to receive you and to, to step into to your kingdom, to cross over from darkness to light, from death to life. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.